you have a pretty interesting background and with um it's interesting to me because i come from um sports performance sports nutrition so i find your background and i've worked with like professional and college athletes pretty cool mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit more about that um so basically i <clears throat> played sports my entire life um growing up uh, my dad was an athlete mm -hmm. and he um, played baseball at the university of arkansas so i was always um playing sports football baseball basketball growing up and then um, my dad played at the university of arkansas underneath the same coach that i ended up playing for so that coach coached there for about 33 years so we played underneath the same coach, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Did he remember you versus your dad? What's like, that? <laughs> did, did he remember your dad when you started? Oh, yeah, playing? yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So it was like me and my dad, and there was um, like two other um, father-son combinations oh, really? that he coached through the years that ended up playing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I've always loved like sports and like sports nutrition and mm -hmm. stuff. My dad was kind of like ahead of his time mm -hmm. growing up. We like didn't have any snacks hardly at all. You're so strict no with your food. diet? Yeah, very okay. strict. <laughs> Interesting. So I've always like followed supplements and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, I've always eaten healthy pretty much my okay. entire life. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, I, from my experience working with a lot of uh, D1 and professional, but really D1 athletes, because they're kind of new, new to the whole profession, being being professional mm -hmm. when it comes to being an athlete. Um, working with professional athletes is a lot easier to get them to follow something because they're like, oh, my paycheck depends on how I, well I perform. Um, whereas D1 athletes haven't really come to that realization yet where they're like, oh, my, how much money I make is really predicated on how well I perform. So like when you're at that level getting, they doing whatever you can to the, get to that extra one or 2%, like that, that might be significant. I mean, a baseball, um, batting in 298 versus batting uh, a 314, it doesn't seem significant, but if you're looking at the bigger picture of playing 162 games in a season, that's correct, right? 162. Um, it could be the, the difference between winning a couple more games getting into the playoffs and and so the the small incremental things matter especially when it comes to um each individual on the team yeah and then like a lot of um a lot of people that go to college from mm -hmm. like smaller towns or like um smaller high schools where they're not really taught mm -hmm. proper nutrition yeah. supplementation even how to work out properly mm -hmm. so once they get into college it's another step up yeah you know so the, they have strength coaches mm -hmm. um, and then also dietary coaches mm -hmm. as well. So it's a big step up from like high school to college and then from college to the pros. Yeah. Even another bigger, bigger step. Yeah. It's what I always found interesting in the NFL. Um, it might be different now. This was about four or five years ago, but in the NFL, only five teams had dietitians on staff. So I think it was the Eagles, the Broncos, the Bucks. The Rams, can't remember the last, probably the Patriots. Mm -hmm. um, but there were only five teams that had dietitians on staff, oh, which wow. I always thought was pretty crazy uh, because it's so important, especially right. if like, well, any sport is important, but it, especially if like you, you need to perform at peak performance every single time you step on the field or the court or the ice or whatever, it makes sense for professional teams to invest in things like dietitians. Yeah. Uh, but in college, there's actually a lot more because a lot of these schools that have collegiate programs also have like nutrition programs or medical programs or dietetics programs. So like the kind of, I know at UF, um, I knew the former director of nutrition at UF and she ran the entire school, but she was also the dietitian for the football team and the baseball team and the volleyball team. So like they had access to a lot of good information. Um, which allow them to excel at their sports. Right. So I always thought that was pretty, pretty important. Yeah, for sure. And then um, when I was at Arkansas, we had our own cafeteria too. Mm -hmm. So we, we had, um, there was like a bunch of ladies there that knew all the athletes and stuff. Oh, okay. So they would, they would bring us in like um, home cooked stuff as well too. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little perk. <laughs> so as an athlete, you basically, I don't want to say it like this, but you were segregated from, from gen pop because um, you had like your own place to eat your own like, yeah you did so all we, your own things yeah i stayed at an athletic dorm okay so we were kind of separated and we had our own private cafeteria mm. in there as well okay. so yeah um did you have like your own uh like your own separate gym 
compared to like the recreational yeah. gym? <clears throat> so we worked out next to the football stadium. So okay. we had our own um, facility for working out. This is private for athletes only. Ah, okay. And then there was also an indoor 100 yard football stadium or like not stadium, but indoor facility. Ah, okay. So we also work out in there as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah. We would go on the side that um, 100 yard facility mm -hmm. and work out like at six in the morning. And uh, they would basically just try to kill us. <laughs> so you would strength coaches? They would set up, yeah, strength coaches would be in there. So they'd set up agility drills and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So yeah, we had our own private little workout facility as well as um, mm -hmm. indoor workout facility as well. So playing D1 baseball, what was your, how long was your season? Like when did it start and when did it end? So it starts in February, mm -hmm. um, which in Arkansas, it's very cold. Yeah. <laughs> so we had an AstroTurf field, so mm -hmm. um, we could start and play. There were games that I played in where it was actually like starting to snow. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. We, they, they let us wear toboggans because <laughs> it was so cold. We weren't wearing hats. Yeah, <laughs> we wow. weren't toboggans. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, it was like colder than freezing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But it uh, starts in February and then runs through, it goes February, March, April, May. And then if you make like the College World Series, that mm -hmm. starts in early June. So it's a little different than um, the MLB. They start in October, right? Um, no, that's when um, the World Series is. Oh, I'm getting my timeline reviewed. Yeah. yeah. So right okay. now, um, um, the catchers, pitchers reported for spring training early. Mm -hmm. And then spring training has started um, basically right now. Okay. So... Um, the official start of the season, I be get, believe, begins in um, March. March, okay. Yeah. So, is so, there a reason that the, the the catchers and the pitchers come sooner than everybody else? I'm not really sure why they do it that way. Mm -hmm. They just come in to get extra work. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not really sure why they okay. do that. <laughs> you were a pitcher, right? I pitched one game okay. in college, but I mainly played shortstop, second base. Okay. But I did uh, end up pitching. Um, against Auburn in the SEC tournament one year. Oh, nice. I, used to, I used to pitch. Yeah, I used <laughs> to pitch in, um, in high school, and then um, we were playing the SEC tournament. Mm -hmm. So what happened is um, we saved two of our best pitchers mm -hmm. um, for the following uh, regional mm -hmm. tournament. So the coach was like, is there um, anybody here that used to pitch? And I was like, yeah, I used to pitch <laughs> three years ago. <laughs> so he came in and was like, uh, throw a bullpen for me. And then uh, if everything goes well, I might bring you in. So I threw a bullpen for him. He's like, you have two major league pitches right now. Like your fastball and curveball are major league pitches. He's like, I want to bring you in. Wow. Um, so he ended up bringing me in. I pitched like five innings, mm -hmm. ended up getting the win. Struck oh, nice. out like five people, didn't give up any runs. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. What was, uh, what was your... Uh, so you said your your fastball and your curveball were major league. Yeah. Um, what was what was your speed on your fastball? Um, they said like ninety three, ninety four. So That's impressive. My fastball, yeah. yeah. And my curveball is pretty big breaking curveball, yeah. so it's kind of tough for them to hit. <laughs> no, that that's always cool. I um, I used to play baseball when I was younger. I stopped when I was uh, in probably ninth grade because I wanted to focus more on hockey. Uh, but I was always a catcher. Um, but obviously, ninth grade, obviously, you're, you're transitioning from little league to people who actually know how to play. Right. And people who can throw 70, 80, 90. Um, maybe not that that early. But I remember in my last season standing standing at the bat and people who can throw lower 70s, low, low to upper 70s, so in that 70 range. Mm -hmm. And at a place I used to work, we, uh, we worked with professional athletes, particularly baseball. Um, and we had this really state-of-the-art um, pitching simulator. So it was basically like a uh, pitching machine. But the pitching machine, you could adjust the speed, you could adjust the break, you could adjust the ball, and it had like 30 different settings, different types of pitches. And it was kind of crazy because it was just like, I didn't even know there were this many pitches in yeah. baseball. <laughs> right. We would just mess around sometimes. And I mean, I got in the batter's box one time and um, put the machine on a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. And it stood in front of it, and it was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, people <laughs> that never played baseball yeah. or like don't realize how tough it is. Yeah, it's like probably the toughest thing in sport to mm -hmm. do is to hit like a major league fastball. Yeah, like, I mean, uh, we were we were running some stats. Um, you may have seen this stuff before, but um, they were basically little little gy gyrometers that you put on your bat, and what they were doing is they're measuring your bat speed and your um your batting efficiency. Mm -hmm. So how consistent your bat swing was. Like, did it follow Through the zone? Yeah. yeah, like how consistent it was. Um, so what was cool about it is this machine, um, 
it, it was more of a training tool for anything like um basically training where a batter is at and where they need to go um but the some of the data that i gathered not me personally but uh the team i was working with we gathered was that basically a major league batter up against a 95 mile an hour fastball has 0.2 seconds from the time the pitch leaves the pitcher's hand to decide if they're going to the swing. swing right <laughs> to just decide just decide yeah so um so from the pitching mound to, to home plate is 90 feet uh 60 feet 60 feet 60 feet six inches okay in 0.2 seconds the ball has already traveled approximately 15 to 20 feet so it's like a third of the way there mm -hmm. and the batter has the ability to pick up on the laces and the direction it's spinning is it going to break is it going to slide what's it going to do and in 0.2 seconds they decide if they want to swing that's crazy to me um just how fast your brain has to react to that that type of pitch that's why the best hitters mm -hmm. hit 300 so yeah. three out of ten times they're successful yeah and you know i mean that's how difficult it mm -hmm. is you know and I know I saw a weird statistic that if um, if they raise the, raise the pitching mound six inches, I don't know what the standard height is. I think it's eighteen inches. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, but if they raise it six inches, um, pitchers would increase their pitch speed by approximately twenty percent, which is also crazy because you see somebody throwing a hundred mile an hour fastball. Now it's one twenty. Crazy about that is it shows you that like it's not just the arm; it's the whole body because just in pitching the just increasing the mound. Um, with the leverage, yeah, <clears throat> pushing off the mound with your yeah. legs and everything, yeah, yeah, throwing downhill. Mm -hmm. So it just shows you that it's a full body thing. Yeah. Um. So I always found that the the mechanics, um, and statistics in baseball. Oh, what was that movie, Moneyball? Moneyball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, just the statistics in baseball are so crazy. Uh, I used to work with a guy who who's a Braves fan, and you ask him any question about the Braves for the last thirty or forty years, he could tell you who was on the team, what their batting average was, what their ERA was, what, anything. And, and he, he just, he was, he was a stats person. That's okay. what he did. Yeah. His, his job was running statistics. But you would ask him any question about the Braves um, and he would just be able to give you the numbers. Just like, yeah, that season he hit 316. And it was just like, <laughs> how you were taking all that information yeah, you'd look it up and be yeah. like holy crap you're right, right. yeah <laughs> it's just like how do you remember those numbers yeah um but yeah the statistics in baseball because there's so many games there's so many different um markers of performance that the the movie Moneyball is pretty interesting because it's just like that's actually pretty realistic you could predict some of these things yeah for sure but as an athlete um even even in um when you were younger before college did you take any uh, supplements? Um, basically, the only thing I really took back in the day was probably some creatine, mm -hmm. um, protein. Okay. So those two basic ones. The standard ones. Yeah, standard ones. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I graduated high school in 95, so okay. it was kind of before the supplement mm -hmm. boom. Yeah. But, uh, those are the two that I mainly took. Yeah, I remember in, in a previous episode when we were talking with Natalie, she asked um, what the most... the the, the most requested like sports sports supplements Supplement. were and i was like creatine and protein yeah and even she even asked me what i would recommend as sports supplements and i'm like creatine and protein <laughs> right they're like the two most important things creatine has um thousands of studies to prove that hey this works it makes you stronger um it increases your performance so just continue to take it and protein uh protein is another thing that just has so much research to show that hey this works you should probably take protein Right. Like, regardless of its whey protein, pea protein, or I don't know, we're working with a krill protein right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all have their unique benefits, which I find pretty cool. Um, but like overall, improving um, athletic performance, you, you need to be able to build muscle. And creatine and protein bo do both of those things. Right. Speaking of protein, you need to have a lot of people don't know how much to take. Mm -hmm. So if you're wanting to gain weight, do you know what exactly the amount is you should take? I know, what, what's the recommended amount? It's like um, a gram of protein. Is it a gram of protein per pound of body weight so, just to maintain? Yeah, and this is actually a really interesting topic because this has been in huge debate in, um, I, I used to work in, with uh, sports performance, but we were really centered a lot around bodybuilding 
Um, so we would use like our knowledge of like football and basketball and baseball and see like, okay, well this works in these sports. What works best in bodybuilding? Because it it's an anomaly when it comes to sports. It's, you could argue it's really not a sport. It's just like you could argue cheerleading is not a sport, but then there's other people that are like, uh, can you throw a hundred pound girl in the air 50, 15 feet? <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, that takes a lot of effort. Right. Um, so like, I think, I think you could categorize bodybuilding as, as a sport just because you need to, it requires some dedication and you obviously need to lift, lift weights. You need to get strong. Right. Um, this, this has been in debate and I, I have a dietetics background. So going all going through school, they were like, you should have one approximately, these are some arbitrary numbers, but I'll break it down, 0.8 to one gram per kilo of body weight, which breaks down to about 0.4 to 0.5 grams per pound. So in a person like me, I'm about 150 pounds. So that would be, I'm, t I'm eating 75 grams of protein a day. And I think that's incredibly low. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some research that came out about five years ago um, from Dr. Jose Antonio. And he basically showed that, hey, if you double or triple that dose, actually it was doubled and quadrupled that dose. So uh, basically two to four grams per pound approximately. If you double and triple that dose, um, it doesn't really affect your blood markers. It doesn't really affect your health that much. Uh, I think that I think it was a 12 week study. So they didn't look at it over years. They just looked at it for 12 weeks. Um, it, it didn't really hurt very much it, or anything at all for that matter. So and working with with people that that I have in the past, I think maintaining a gram per pound is pretty much your baseline that's where you should be okay um i've e i've i've had some success with increasing to like two grams per pound um i've even in some people i've even go gone as high as four grams per pound but they were really specific scenarios like they were prepping for a bodybuilding show and if they ate fat or carbs they would gain weight so i'm like well you need to eat something right so i'll just give them extra protein um it takes a lot more energy for your body to metabolize protein. So I could give them calories through protein and then their body, it, it, it would just take a lot longer to break it down. Okay. Um, but yeah, the general recommendation of about one gram per pound is pretty solid. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we need to deviate from that much, deviate from that very much. Um, so that's why most proteins on the market um, they're really gunning for that 20 to 30 grams. I mean, most most of your customers are probably requesting 20 to 30 grams of protein mm -hmm. per serving. I think that's basically what your body can break down to, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's... um. It's like anything you take over maybe like 40 grams, you're like basically just wasting. Uh, Is that right? So there's some information that came out on that recently. I, I think the way that that was presented was incorrect. Um, just It just generally presented your body will use everything that you consume. But there's no, there may not be any additional benefit to consuming 25 grams versus 75 grams. Right. So like, if you consume 25 grams, you're gonna get the same benefit as consuming 75. Okay. So that's kind of the, uh, a better way to word it. Um, that's why I recommend just sticking around that 20 to 30 because you're really gonna, max, it, you're really just trying to maximize your body's anabolic response to the protein. And if you go over that, it might be beneficial. I don't know. It's it's yet to be elucidated. We don't really know. Um, there's some people that say you can you should 40, 50, 60 grams. But for the most part, I think staying around the 20 to 30 is pretty solid. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. And you're gonna maximize your body's response to the training. So that's maybe it after a workout or maybe as a meal replacement in the middle of the day. Maybe you're you worked out in the morning and it's two o'clock in the afternoon and you're hungry, instead of reaching for like a bag of chips, consuming something like protein in like a 20 or 30 gram dose, whether it's through a protein powder or real food, whatever it may be, it's probably gonna be more beneficial if your goal is like building muscle or improving your like athletic performance. Right, and yeah. then uh, whey protein as far as like isolate, that's probably the purest form, right? There is one, there, there's a few that are more pure um, then isolate, there's um, hydrolyzed whey protein. And hydrolyzed whey protein is they take basically protein isolate 
and they treat it with enzymes and they take these long chains of amino acids called peptides and they break them down. So now it's similar to isolate where you have these just chains of amino acids, but they're in smaller um, peptides or they're in smaller chains. So now it's easier for the body to metabolize it because they are smaller. Um, it's, it's more of a speed thing, it's faster. Um, and there's also some issues with like isolate, very few people have problems digesting isolate and hydrolyzed whey protein. Um, we've also worked with the clear whey recently, which that's a um, a clear, I think that's an isolate. Uh, but it's pretty cool because you dissolve it in water and it's completely clear. Once you get into like the concentrates, um, some people may have a hard time digesting them because they still have like a high amount of lactose in them. Mm -hmm. So like if you're lactose intolerant, you might have a problem with a concentrate but you might not have a problem with like a hydrolyzed. Uh, the problem is, is a hydrolyzed is double the price of a concentrate. If you go into the market and you're looking at like a hydrolyzed whey protein, you're generally gonna find that they're like double the price of just a generic whey protein. That's right. just because the material is so expensive. Okay, and then speaking of protein and like getting it in your system, like after you work out, <laughs> it's probably better to get it into your system. Quickly. Like very quickly, right? Yeah. But then like maybe like 30 minutes or so after a workout? Yeah, about 30 minutes. Um, thir uh, no more than an hour, but I think your your window's less than an hour, but ideally about 30 minutes. So after, after you work out, consuming that 20 to 30 grams of protein would probably be ideal. Consuming some carbohydrates with them. So like if you're, so if your goal is like trying to lose weight or something like that, and you still have a sweet tooth, consuming it after your workout um, if you're having a hard time like sticking to your diet and you still want to snack on stuff, mm -hmm. if you can like revolve it around your workout and do it afterwards or right before, um, you're kind of, not only is it going to be meet your like craving or, your, or satiate you, um, but it's also it might be a little bit more beneficial because now it actually will help your body replenish the energy you just burned from working out. So consuming that carb and um, small dose of carbs and protein after your workout, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. That's when you can do like the snacks. Like if you, if for some reason you love fruit roll ups, or not some unknown reason, <laughs> right. you just love fruit roll ups, <laughs> yeah. and you can't go a day without eating a fruit roll up. Well, if you're having a hard time losing weight, then doing it right after you work out will be the lesson, the, not the best, because I don't recommend people eat fruit roll ups, but like less detrimental if i have to say it that way. right yeah um so uh, my girlfriend likes to satiate her sweet tooth with uh protein bars yeah <laughs> like at not late at night yeah she's like uh, want something sweet but mm -hmm. she'll just take a little bit of a protein bar mm -hmm. so it's just a good way to satiate your uh sweet tooth in like a healthy healthy manner i kind of do the same thing i've actually kind of been doing the same thing for the last decade i, I used to work at gnc so i had access to like as many protein bars as i wanted john if you're listening i didn't, <laughs> I didn't steal things <laughs> I, I just got them at a discounted price. Yeah. They were always good because it was just like, oh, I forgot lunch or, oh, I don't want to buy lunch or, oh, I'm trying to do this. Yeah. If you're yeah. in a hurry, yeah. you're in a pickle and you just need something quick, mm -hmm. get the calories. And and then, um, so after after college, you, um, oh, we, did, we didn't mention when you were in college, did you take any supplements? Yeah. Um, basically the same, same that I did growing up. So okay. creatine and, um, protein powder. Okay. Basically were the only two that we took. And were they issued by the college? Um, so we had a refrigerator mm -hmm. inside of, um, our facility. Mm -hmm. So you could just grab like, um, protein drinks mm -hmm. or whatever. So it was all provided okay. um, by the university. Uh, what was the brand? Do you remember? Was I it, cannot remember. Is it purple? Uh, yeah. EAS. Yeah. EAS. Yeah. 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 EAS. Yeah. EAS yeah. Um, so EIS is one of the only, um, not only, but one of the, the biggest uh, NSF certified sport uh, protein companies. Okay. So like you have, uh, what's that one? Uh, Muscle Milk. Mm -hmm. Muscle Milk is a uh, certified sport and EIS is certified sport. Okay. And basically what that means is like if you would have went to GNC and gotten something off the shelf, and it wasn't um, certified sport. Uh, so like, inf sorry, I keep saying certified sport. It's informed sport or NFSF certified sport. So these are two certifications. And basically what they say is, we've tested this product for purity and potency 
and that it doesn't contain any banned substances. Banned stuff. Yeah. 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 So if you would have just went to GNC and gotten something off the shelf and you didn't know anything about it, it could have contained like you were in the you were playing baseball during the uh, during the the anabolic steroid era. With, oh yeah, uh, with yeah, like, back uh, in the day yeah. when yeah, McGuire yeah. and yeah, Sammy Sosa. Yep. Yeah. And then they got caught, but then they started taking what what we call designer steroids, mm -hmm. which were basically either most of them were capsules. You just take them, and your body just turns it into testosterone or some type of derivative, and you were basically just taking anabolic steroids, but it was less, uh, more conspicuous. Right. So like, um, sorry, less conspicuous. Um, where like they had to start developing tests to be able to trace them because they were new. They're designer steroids. Right. Especially in the early two, late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of supplement companies were just like dosing random things in their supplements. So like you could have been taking these designer steroids. That's why like the informed sport and the NSF certified sport certifications became so big is because the um, NCAA recognized them as like, hey, we don't want our athletes getting a competitive edge by taking something that may enhance their performance. So we're going to make sure that if they're taking a supplement, um, it needs to be certified so that we can go check that it doesn't include any of these steroids or designer steroids. So that's why at your, your university, they probably supplied it to you because they were like, well, they're going to either go buy it themselves and it, they might get flagged. Or we just give it to them and then they're fine. Right. I think there's um, some Olympians that were taking some some supplements that oh, they yeah. took, uh, like in a vitamin shop yeah. or a GNC, mm -hmm. and they got flagged for it. And they're like, yeah. "I was just taking this." Yeah. But it's got they had no idea, no idea what was yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, and that that's what's interesting because that was quite recently too. That was like the 2016 Olympics. Yeah. That was quite recently. So even recently, there's companies still doing still that. Still doing it. Right. Um, it just shows you how like some supplement manufacturing is like kind of the wild west where it's like people you can just go sell anything you want and that's why like at bio bio lab we have such a high quality standard i mean we can sit here and talk all day about how quality makes our lives difficult like you've been trying to release a product for the last week and you can't do it because of quality, quality control yeah <laughs> right um but another reason why we're doing an nsf audit right now right so like back at our facility we have a uh, NSF auditor coming in from the NSF organization doing our annual GMP audit. So they'll be there for today, the next three days, just auditing all of our paperwork, everything that we do to make sure that we're we're staying up to NSF standards, um, which the NSF standards are a little bit more strict than FDA standards. So it kind of goes above the FDA regulations. Another step up. Yeah. yeah. So right now I saw that you, you have a you actually requested it directly from me, a uh, customer w wanting to work with uh, doing a bunch of stuff with like creatine. Mm -hmm. So they they wanted a specific type. They wanted Crea Pure, Pure, which comes from the company in um, Germany. Germany. Yeah, mm -hmm. Allschem. Um, and Allschem is a really good company, and they made this uh, super. It's creatine monohydrate, but it's more pure, uh, so they have a higher yield, and um, it's one of the best selling protein. Uh, sorry, creatines on Amazon. It's um, a blend, right? Is it a blend of no, it's just one creatine. Just one creatine. Yeah, creatine monohydrate, okay. kind of your standard form. Um, but your customer, they're putting it, they wanted a stick pack, they wanted a jar, and then they wanted an electrolyte and a pre-workout, but all of them use the Creapure, right? Correct. So they wanted them all in stick pack. Mm -hmm. At BL Biolab, we, we just got our stick pack machine, so we can do, based on the output, approximately 100,000 stick packs a day if we were to run it continuously. In terms of requests for stick packs, how common is it? It seems to be increasingly, um, I'm getting a lot more requests for mm -hmm. it right now. Um, especially I have a guy that's in um, the UK mm -hmm. and he said that there's not really that many stick pack products mm -hmm. over there. Okay. Um, so just very handy for people on the go. Yeah. They throw it in a backpack, throw mm -hmm. it on their purse. So he was um, requesting that just for, um, for the ability to just be able to to take a supplement on the road with you. Yeah. You know, if you're in a bind or mm -hmm. something, you can just like pour electrolytes, protein mm -hmm. powder, whatever you want to in that. So it seems like stick packs are starting to become a lot more popular. Yeah. We, we kind of saw that on the go thing with like ready to drinks, like RTDs, like proteins, um, and then kind of transition into like protein bars. 
And then now we're getting to a point where people don't want to lug around maybe a one gallon jug of protein or like maybe a 20 ounce jar. So they want them in stick packs. Mm -hmm. um, and the cool thing about the stick pack machine is we can, we can put a lot of things in it. And we have a lot of versatility with like the types of films we use. So we can use like a metal film. We can use a plastic film, like a metal liner. Uh, we can do paper film if you wanted. It's probably not the best for supplements because it absorbs moisture. But that's what's cool about the stick pack machine. It has a lot of versatility. If there's certain types of marketing claims that you want, you can put it in really any film that you want. Yeah, so I've, I've seen it. I've been wanting to get that machine since I started working here uh, just because I... I saw that the market was kind of going that way and i'm like this would be this would be good to have yeah it's gonna be a great asset mm -hmm. for us for sure because um we were be able to we were able to make stick packs but we were outsourcing it yeah. with a different company mm -hmm. so it's going to be nice to be able to do it in-house yeah and um in addition to that a lot of the customers that we have now who maybe sell their product in a jar or a bag or something we can offer this as a secondary packaging configuration like hey do you want to take your product that you're currently putting in a jar and do you want to put it in a stick pack and with that we can do as little as like one or two grams in this stick pack to as high as uh 20 or 25 grams so there's a really broad range of things that we can put in there yeah so when it comes to like product trends specifically sports nutrition is there anything that you get a lot of requests for i would say the bulk of my requests are <clears throat> protein mm -hmm. protein powders pre-workouts, okay. um, creatine. Um, those are the three main ones that okay. I think I get the, the most requests for. And are they coming from the U.S. or are they coming abroad? Both. Both. So I'm getting requests from all over the world, um, a lot of Middle East, mm -hmm. um, getting some requests from South Korea, okay. um, China, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia. So You seem to have a lot of customers from... from um... South Korea. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. interesting to me. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's wild. <laughs> I, I didn't know South Korea was such a hotbed for dietary supplements. Yeah, so I have two customers in South Korea. One, uh, we did the enzymes, the DPP4 mm -hmm. enzymes. And then um, the other one is um, liposomal vitamin C. So, Which was a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't well, easy to encapsulate. <laughs> yeah, liposomal products are difficult to make because uh, liposome is you're basically putting a layer of fat. Uh, it's more like a lecithin, but it's, it acts similar to fat around your active. So you have like, this one specifically was like L-ascorbic acid, and it was encapsulated in like this liposome. But what was challenging about it is since it's like greasy and sticky, um, you can like take the powder and squeeze it in your hand and make like a snowball. Yeah, That's it was how, almost like magic sand. Yeah, uh, it, it was exactly what it was like. Yeah. My kid plays with that. So like, yeah, it's <laughs> the exact same thing. You grab it and you can like mold, mold it. it and, it's really annoying because it's hard to encapsulate. It doesn't flow through the equipment. So there's a lot of stuff we had to do to it, um, not just with the powder, but like with the equipment. We had to make it slower. We needed to change the speed of the auger. We needed to change the humidity and the temperature to make sure that we could uh, run it properly. And it was just a nightmare. Something that should have taken us three days took us a month. Yeah, the customer was wanting it to be natural because mm -hmm. people in South Korea don't like excipients. Oh, okay. So that's why we use the acacia gum, yeah. which was a natural excipient. So. Yeah, that's uh, we ended up making it work by putting... Um, so the acacia is... Um, it can act as an emulsifier, or which emulsifier basically binding up fat and water. But what it did in this case was it, it, it encapsulated the, uh, the liposome so we put like a layer around it, which that allowed it to flow. So it wasn't sticky and, and matty anymore. Um, and it, we were actually able, able to encapsulate it doing that, but it was just a nightmare getting there. It was an absolute nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> and I know we, re we did some of it, released some of the product, but like that ran into our NSF audit and it was just with our NSF audit, we didn't want a bunch of chaos going on. So we had to like pause encapsulating it and wait until that's over because there were strict guidelines that we needed to follow. Right. I was actually listening to the NSF auditor today uh, when she was discussing with her quality team, talking about how people in Asia, particularly China, they, they won't buy supplements from China. They want US-made supplements, which I find that really interesting because a lot of the materials are coming from China. Coming from there, yeah, right. Sent to the US, 
packaged in their their form, final form factor and then sent back to China s- to sell. I, I always found, found that interesting. Probably because of our quality standards. Yeah, possibly a lot higher. Yeah. So yeah, but I I notice that a lot of these requests are coming from Asian countries or really the Eastern Hemisphere altogether. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Travis, for discussing this with me today. It was great learning more about sports supplements and your experience with them. If you found this episode useful, remember to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications for future episodes.